Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to Cosmic Redux. I'm your host, Mr. Canada Lover, but we have a Canadian-British cultural fusion. Cultural developments within Canada have typically been motivated more by the U.S. and our former friends and protectors in London. However, the fall of the British Empire and the flight of almost 5 million exiles to Canada had an insurmountable effect on Canadian culture. The exiles we now call Canada home have imported their customs shaping Canada and their image as the influence of the U.S. on Canada wanes. British cultural customs have become commonplace within Canada, with the popularity of such Anglo culinary staples like fish and chips and tea taking off in urban areas. Canadian cities are being redesigned to accommodate the exiles, with American influence infrastructure being reoriented to make match the design of British cities such as Manchester and London. Double decker buses have been be uh, begun gracing the streets of London and Ottawa and Toronto, and London's stereotypical red phone booths and mailboxes have begun to pop up on Canadian streets. This cultural fusion has led to a bizarre mishmash of British and Canadian culture forming as Canadians begin to speak with British accents, the RCMP adopting the Bobby cust custodian helmet in addition to their Sarge uniforms. And the f bizarre food combinations such as maple tea and fish and chips poutine become uh, complex. While London may be lost, it seems like the UK is living on in Canada as the frozen plains of the Great White North are shaped and molded in the image of the Old Britain. Cheerio, huh? Ah, as we, right now we are getting ready to... Well, I wanted to ship these guys off here. You're going to go back. I don't mind sending my mar uh, marines, maybe? Tanks over? Uh, what is a landscape down here? Looks like there's a lot of planes. We'll send the tanks this way, maybe. Well, we send the marines that way. Um, the tanks we have aren't very good. Uh, I want you in Detroit. Because as you can see, they're getting ready to beat the crap out of us. Or we're getting ready to beat the crap out of them. We're trying to invest and in, or ask these people to invest into the IEDC. You know, the Entente. And we're going to invite South Rhodesia as well. Now, we've already done this. We've invested in ourselves, of course. We invested in the French national state. So next, we'll probably invest in the uh, Australian Confederation, the South Rhodesian, and all these other guys. I've seen the wisdom of our offer and agreed to join the IEDC, including an initial investment of 25 political power. The first South Rhodesian economists and engineers have already begun to arrive in the Kingdom of Canada. Excellent. Fantastic. Um, so there it goes. The war, as we saw last time. American chaos. Um... Did I do this one, read this one before? Chaos has overtaken our neighbors to the south, and even worse, the Socialist Party of America has promised or proclaimed a stronghold right off our southern border. A number of the northeastern governors of New England, their states beset by a syndicalist militia violence, have asked our government to enact the Derby Line Protocol. Clearly, they feel the federal government is incapable of defending them. And though some of our ministers feel this might be seen as some of the factions, less as intervention and more as aggression. The say of the matter should be debated in Parliament before any action is taken. For New England, at least, that might not be quick enough uh, to save them. Which I think I did read this last time. Um. Well, if you want to do this one of these, anyways, please go ahead. Hey, look at that. Fantastic. Get out, America. This is ours now. Fund the military. Well, that'd be nice. Military production. I, I just don't want to lose stability, so. We're probably going to need act, at, at least limited conscription. Yeah. Expand the secret police. The Mounties. Oh, keeping watch over law and order at home is the first line of our defense. Let's provide the RCMP the tools they need, even if Canadians find such a move unpopular. Less opinion autocracy. Emergency draft, huh? British exiles drafted. Uh, we're going to expand the secret police. The king's condition. It's been months since a fateful day when the vile assassin struck at our King Edward VIII, with almost worldly, mortally wounding him. It, while he had not perished in the attack, his. He's been in a coma ever since, and despite his heart still beating, many have begun questioning the merits of having a key in absentia. While the king's closest advisors hold out hopefully his recovery, his doctors have little good news, even if some of the most fervent loyalists of the king have considered the merits of pulley, simply pulling the plug. Compare amounts of regicide. Good night, sweet prince. And with our brave King Edward's tragic death, uh oh, the question of who will succeed in these tragic circumstances has arisen. The logical choice would be Prince Albert. He's the eldest heir and a favorite of the late King George, though there is concern regarding his both his health and his profound lack of social ability. Is he the right choice to lead the empire? With normal succession already thrown out of the window, it would be possible for another prince to be chosen. King prince Henry is considered a biddable man, and his military experience, that would be of good use. Prince George. Meanwhile, he's the youngest, but is charismatic, and already has a son, and sure, a future king to follow. I like this one, but you know what? What will happen if, king, if, if we get King Albert? What happens if we get him? Look at this guy. Humble. Well, no, it's Albert I that's humble. So, we'll see. I would like to go to partial mobilization. I wish we could go to here, but you know, whatever. We have you here. More air XP is pretty nice. Um, but we will have to get ready to go to war soon. Oh, King Edward VIII passes away. Oh no! The first British king to not be crowned in the halls of Westminster Abbey is once again made headlines as the first king to face death by assassination. The assassin, later identified as an American anarchist, hurled an improvised bomb at the king, killing many of his closest advisors instantly. 
and sent King Edward to a coma from which he would never wake. What was held out for king, uh, the king's recovery? It has been announced today that the king was too far gone for recovery, and the plans for succession are already underway. Prince Albert, viewed as a quiet and socially awkward man, is set to be crowned as King Albert I, inheriting the rule over the British Empire. That is vastly different from that of his grandfather's. Long live the king! Because we got some commies to kill. Oh, cynicalists to kill them. They're not commies, they're cynicalists. And we're losing political power, so we might as well use it as fast as we possibly can. Uh, naval focus. Just a fat point one two. Nice. Of course, I want them to leave caps, but I do want to address the army. The current Canadian army is a strange mix of both national militia surrounding a core of exiled British professionals. With war looming on the horizon, it's time to reorganize the Canadian army into a unified fighting force, taking inspiration from the legacy of the Grand British Army and her achievements in the Great War. So, Chief of the Army. I mean, I would like more daily army XP. Attack and defense of core territory. It's not bad. Division attrition's okay. Breakthrough? That would be bad either. Air command, navy, air, air. Oh, so you do choose two of these. Okay, interesting. So we can get fuller here. Um, the supply consumption, defense, static, uh, so defense and organ and consumption. Chief of the army, armor spearhead. We're truck recognized. We're not using armor that much in this campaign. I always like guns and butter to get more organization, which is good. Better supply consumption is not bad. Overall, it's not bad. Uh, supply grace. We're gonna go with guns and butter. Because we could use that. And also, I'm sending a few guys over to. Uh, uh, India as well. The Royal Navy seized Puerto Rico after seizing New England. The Royal Navy set up to the Caribbean to seize the island of Puerto Rico. While well, local National Guard was informed of Canadian attempts to take over, they quickly stood down as they realized they had no chance of defending the island against the new occupiers. While well, many Americans from Puerto Rico returned to the mainland to fight the Civil War, others have chosen to stay and pledge their allegiance to us in exchange for keeping their jobs. Nevertheless, our control over the Caribbean is now even stronger. All job well done. When is the last time I played Kaiser Redux? When was this even green? But Alaska requires intervention. The American territory of Alaska has expressed or experienced a severe shortage of needed supplies following the outbreak of the Civil War. After recent bombing the city of Juneau, Alaska Governor Ernest Gruning is in fear of a breaking down of order. One that far off the uh, federal government will be too busy to respond to, thus he, like the New England governors, has requested that the Canadian government intervene for the interim to keep the peace. While well, most of our government is calling for us to move in, some of the more fiscally minded members of Parliament are calling us to relieve them in their own devices, as subsidizing Alaska will no doubt use up resources that would otherwise be dedicated to retaking the whole miles. Many believe that if we decline to directly intervene, the Alaskan government will reluctantly declare independence for their own safety. An independent Alaska, which would no doubt almost immediately fall under the influence of the Entente to prevent this valuable territory from falling into enemy hands. Intelligence reports also suggest that the Alaskan governor is a supporter of the Pacific government's claim to the true America, so we can temporarily move in to restore order and arrange a clandestine meeting in Vancouver between representatives from the Alaskans and Pacific governments that are almost certainly ending Alaska joining the Pacific states and potentially securing a survivable alliance in the process. We should move in. A proxy government in Alaska? Alaska is on its own. Nah, we, we're going in. Sports exchange. As the British exiles and Canadians have come to live side by side for an increased period of time, aspects of each other's culture begin to emerge and intermingle, of course, again. While the high minded aristocrats have kept to their own hobbies carried over from the Isles, the lower class exiles have sought to blend in with the Canadian hosts. One way they begin to do this is a growing love for hockey among the exile population. While well, once a more or less Canadian sport has begun to grow in popularity among the Bretons in Canada, with more British players appearing in hockey drafts and more British fans accompanying their Canadian fans at games. Many British hockey players, such as James Foster, Carl Erdhart, Edgar Chirp Brenchley, and Jimmy Chappell have gained positions in Canadian leagues, playing alongside many British-born Canadian players such as Alex Smith, Bobby Connors, Alex Gray, Eric Pettinger, Irv Frew, and Sam McAdam. Due to the fact that most of Britain's hockey players are Canadian, or otherwise lived in Canada, hockey's fallen out of popularity within the United Kingdom, with, ma with the majority of Unionist hockey players being either French or Russian. This reverse has also come to be as more Canadians have grown to love football, or soccer, some American influence Canadians call it, as well as cricket and rugby. With British influence is quickly getting a solid hold on the bustling radio and television networks, with these networks, British backwards. Backers have encouraged increasing coverage of these British games. These games, managed by the newly established Canadian Football League, make use of the established British brands like Manchester United and Arsenal, along with the new Canadian teams like the Toronto City Club and the Victoria Club. The saturation of the games on many nationwide broadcasts began to win over Canadians, and British football is quickly rising to be one of the most popular sports in Canada, beyond or behind so hockey itself. A good way to build bridges. Because we're probably going to turn them down someday. Do we have anything else for the planes? We do want good planes, though. So. No, we're good on planes. 37, not bad. Extraction, um, do we need that? Oh, uh, yeah, let's see, we could probably use a little more extraction. What do we got here? Infantry equipment, sure. 
Costa Rica requests our protection. Horrified by the recent civil war in the U.S., a small nation looks in fear uh, to its eastern and northern borders, waiting for an attack now that its protector is at war, and is requested we open and express our desire to keep Costa Rica as a sovereign state. While our interests in this neighbor, Panama, are far greater, we could potentially support the regime and establish another Entente foothold in the Caribbean. Offer them assurances. Puerto Rican delegation arrives at Ottawa. With a seizure of Puerto Rico from the Americans, a Puerto Rican delegation was hastily assembled on the island from former members of the island's legislature. Led by liberal Antonio Rafael Barcelo, one of the biggest proponents of the Puerto Rican independence movement outside of the nationalists, the delegation has proposed that the government be, to be given independence in exchange for loyalty to the Entente. While discussions with the delegation dragged on, it became evident that the island will accept nothing more than independence, as annexation into another nation without government representation, as it happened with the U.S., would be unacceptable for the locals. Furthermore, mentioning to the delegation that they could become a part of the West Indies Federation caused outrage, as they quoted the Moyne report as proof that the West Indies wouldn't be able to properly handle Puerto Rico. With the talk having been finished for the day, the question remains what to do with the island. Occupying it or giving to the West Indies Federation will clearly anger the locals, but granting independence outright might weaken our position in the Caribbean, in the case they decide they no longer want to help us. Give it the Federation. Maintain the occupation. Give the delegates their independence. They become a puppet of us. Puerto Rico, give the delegates their independence. Play as them. Um, I kind of like the occupation. I'm being very occupied minded this this time. Oh, we have so much compliance. What are they? T local police? No, no, no. Hold on. No. We want. I mean, don't worry. You get less compliance, less garrisons, way less damage to garris uh, garrisons. Resistance target. But you get normal compliance growth, which I do like. You get less resistance too, but still. We can handle it. We're going to maintain occupation for now. Question of uh, the New England future. Now that we see New England, a number of Canadian ministers met with the leaders from the states regarding how to best keep order. Having spent the majority of the latter half of 1936 holding or preparing the groundwork for provisional government, New Englander leaders hold that the granting power to the provisional government to be no brainer. Reminding your ministers that empowerment of their provisional government was one of the provisions of the Derby Line Protocol, they confirmed the need for a few of their entente protection, all but ensuring that New England would remain as entente protectorate. All but uh, some members of the government, however, have suggested it would be better if we push forward with this provisional government, but co opt it. This faction suggests the creation of a new dominion. Under the watchful eye of a governor general, this, they claim, will give the New Englanders the autonomy they crave while allowing us to keep a close on the region. Others in the government, however, adamant that we simply maintain our occupation and administrate the territory ourselves. Some Americans, they say, are of suspect loyalty, grateful or not, to their goals may not mirror our own. Where the pre existing foundation for a new state already existing, we can simply use this machinery to better keep to better keep New England under our thumb, and in any case, New England's leadership and citizenry are chopping the bet to learn their fate, and we're not the ones to keep people waiting. Set a provisional government. Set a provisional government. Continue the military occupation. Set a pro uh, provisional government, but prepare to appoint a governor general. Oops, my finger slipped. Economic recovery. Remove Great Depression. That'd be so good to do. Oh, we need oil as well. So I didn't see it on the rail. But I want to get involved in the American Civil War. The unthinkable has occurred. The United States has devolved into another civil war. The only could tear apart their nation, one that, one that could tear apart ours as well. Intervention debate. The possibility that has been raised in the House of Commons that we should recognize one of the competing factions of the American Civil War and offer them support in form of volunteers and guns. It will be sure to upset the others, but we stand do, we stand by and do nothing. It seems like this could end in disasters. Sir Abercrombie's work, huh? Quid pro quo. Accept if no, did they accept the request to join the Entente? We will return all American lands which we do not claim ourselves. Frontline of Redcoat Revenge. Oh. Union of Mutual Interests. Oh. What if we were here just to pacify them? Hmm. After we refuse to occupy New England. Huh. Because I know you can get cores on New England, I think, eventually. Owns Maine. Has joined the Kingdom of Canada after we refuse to occupy them. Panama sees the canal. Upon the start of the American Civil War, Panama took a 13 mile long canal zone from the U.S. officially to safeguard it from radicalism. This could be advantageous for us, as we can demand that Panama either joins the Entente or hand over the canal, as they would not be in a good position to refuse. 
Leave him alone. Do they want to join us? They joined us! Look at that! Darn them. Finished in 1914, the Panama Canal is one of the most important trade passageways to the American continent, controlled by the United States. Until now, with the outbreak of the Second American Civil War, the federal government is forced to withdraw from the canal's marine forces, leaving it open to invasion. And to little surprise, Panamanian troops launched an operation to take back such a viable area. This move, however, was opposed by Canada, which presented to them an ultimatum. Panama's sovereignty over the canal will be recognized, but the country must agree to a military alliance or face invasion. In the face of Canadian pressures, the small Latin American country has backed down, defeating the crisis. Panama agrees turns. And now, the Can Panama Canal and our influence. A monarchy, you say? What if I just want to go to war with these guys anyways and just kill them and eat their tector myself? Royal address. He's got low popularity. Ah, and by Panama, yes, please. They agree to join. Fantastic. Ah, it's the South. It seems likely that we'll intervene in the American Civil War at some point. Before we do, however, we must prepare defenses and lessen the chances that any such intervention will end up being pure folly on our part. Suggestion for Walter Guinness and the Commission. Walter Guinness and the rest of the Commission have come up with a suggestion to help out the situation within the West Indies as a two-year fund into the West Indies to help them along with a new multitude of projects to help the region. Also take a toll on our income. It could serve significantly towards helping them calm, calm down the rapid socialist movements within the West Indies, uh, but along with helping them develop their industries along the way. Sure, this isn't our responsibility. It's fine. You can have a tiny bit of funding. So we send the Marines here. The prospection or prospect of intervention. Parliament has begun a tense debate over whether the Canadian government should recognize one of the warring factions in the South as a real America. It's a tricky situation, as doing so will anger the other factions and potentially leave us with a hostile victory in the South, but even worse is the prospect of the so-called Combined Syndicates of America winning the day. We cannot be expected to fight wars elsewhere with a syndicalist government sitting directly to the South, can we? For now, support merely means directing the Entente and volunteers and equipment, but if we pick a side, some suggestions are getting drawn and the conflict will become inevitable. Armed uprising has been prevented. Crossing the border. We can help them out. Declare support. You know what? I'm going to say no. Can we, can we manage just find them? Is that allowed? Honestly, I don't know why. I just want to eat up America. Oh, we can't just find them. We need more political power. And roll attention. Hmm. We can help them out and then refuse and then fight them and then hopefully not die. War support, war support, war support. We get more stability though here. We're still getting weekly stability. Oh, weekly changes going up. That's good. Yeah, from Stanley, Stanley Baldwin. I do like the stability and political power. Can we use that political power immediately for something else? Honestly, stop southern syndicalists. It appears the CSA is on the verge of winning the civil war in the South. While they're strong, we must face them now or risk facing them later. Once they're recovered and gathered to full strength, we cannot afford to let the international have a world power on our southern border. May God forgive us for what we must do, but the time's coming to invade the South America. Or South, invade the South. We need to cross a border. We can't have crippling strikes or divide a nation. Hmm. What if we say no? Like we we want like XP and whatnot, but issue trade embargo. Oh, some material support. Interesting. Crisis over Koto. Ever since the independence of Panama from Spain, they've laid claim to the Overcoto, a region of Panama's Chiriqui province with the Panamanian Costa Rican border. In 1911, the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, Edward D. White, was asked to arbitrate. He rendered his decision in 1914, but Panama did not accept it, alleging that it favored Costa Rica. All broke out in 1921, when Costa Rica invaded the area. Panama recaptured the area very easily, though. The conflict spread, however, when Costa Rica moved into the province of Bocas del Toro, fearing that, that its interests might be threatened. The U.S. forced Panama to accept the white decision. Well aware that the Americans are in no position to save Costa Rica once more, the Panama government sent another ultimatum to San Jose, demanding the extradition of the Costa region. 
Even though we have little reason to mingle in their disputes, we find a peaceful resolution to the crisis will reaffirm our status as excellent negotiators and could force the Central American region back into submission. Offer sit down with Panama. Nationals murder Puerto Rico's chief of police. Well, that's not smart to do, probably. Can you actually help out here? This do anything here? Uh we have to hold the line. Oh, we have three divisions here. They're Marines. They're only eight combos, though. Not great. This morning, we received a chilling report from Puerto Rico. Apparently, two Puerto Rican nationals, Ram Orozado and Elias Bolchev, assassinated the chief of police on the island, Colonel Francis E. Riggs, considered by the locals as an act of revolutionary justice. As Riggs was blamed for the Rio pa Piedras massacre, it was then followed up by the extrajudicial murder of both nationals at the hands of the local police acting without orders. Not enough for this nationalist to have managed to assassinate a high-ranking official on the island, and having gained two martyrs, nationalist leader presented himself in the funeral of the victims, providing a stirring speech for the crowd. We've already brought to you the precious uh, ashes of other heroes. Nationalism has brought the island into transmutation, for man was not born to vegetate nor grow fat and strong, but to stand firm upon the supreme principles worthy of his immortality. There's only one gateway to immortality, the gateway of valor, which leads to sacrifice for a sacred, sacred cause. We must all sacrifice ourselves for the independence of our country. With this, the future of the island becomes more uncertain with each passing day as more people join the national ranks. It seems a revolt is inevitable. Panama demands monetary compensation. Claiming that the loss of territory has come at great cost to the Panamanian economy, the government of Panama City has his of Costa Rica compensate them for a hypothetical losses before any further discussion can continue. Just agree to it, you goddamn ding dongs. Canada accepts the solution. Although the government uh, in San Jose is unconvinced by the claims that uttered by the Panamanian delegation, they decided to accept the proposal to preserve the peace in the region. During a period of one year, Costa Rica will pay 5% of its income tax uh, to the Panamanians to compensate them for the loss, and in return, Panama will give up all claims in the region for the eternity. We truly make the best deals. Fantastic. And that limited conscription, yeah. Because right now we're going to lose it immediately if we don't spend it. Um, which I don't want to, that to happen. And oh, we have nothing to spend it on, though. Hmm. Emergency draft. There are a number of British exiles present in Canada who are either too old to serve and the military are unwilling. The old guard can serve as mentors to the new, and the unwilling should serve to fight for their homeland whether they wish to or not. The time is coming to call them to service. British exiles drafted. More organization. Max planning. Go ahead and use it. Violent administrations in Quebec. Even though full conscription has not yet been implemented, the more limited form enacted by the conservative government has still caused quite a reaction, strong reaction in Quebec. Throughout the province, demonstrations have broken out with signs carried that either call for a Quebec separation from Canada or death of the English king. While the RCMP has been able to restore order so far, it's not without several of the demonstrations having turned incredibly violent, along with the promises that should full conscription ever be implemented, things would get far worse. Well, bro, that sucks. You're gonna fight no matter what, though. Ah, it's the south. Can we actually do anything here? I don't think we can. So we're going to do that. I do I do want to do this stuff as well. The new home of the free. That's suffering from refugee crisis. <sighs> I want to do all this stuff, but we can't. We're going to come back over here. I think I read this last time. So. You're going to do this, please go ahead. Ooh. Yeah, I don't think we can do very much here. We've lost how many guys? Not that many. Because they're just, they're just too strong there. We're just here to hold, hold the line. And I want to get involved here as fast as we possibly can. Nationals attack a police armory. A small national contingent of around 50 men, inspired by the sacrifice of Ram Rosado and Elias Bocha, have thrown a police station armed with little more than a few smuggled weapons, neither in their fists. The managed to successfully seize and escape to El... Uh, you could the forest before reinforcements could arrive to stop them. As an investigation of the case was gone going, it was clear that the plan had been carefully orchestrated with the insider support, and an investigation of the police stations and garrisons have shown us that the nationals may have bigger sway than we originally thought, as some police officers have willingly given access to the rebels to weaponry in some instances. While for all intents and purposes our loss in equipment isn't big, it's still a significant step for the nationals, as they now have the means to carry out even more daring attacks. This keeps getting better and better. Refugees flood in upstate New York. With the situation in America worsening, it's no surprise that the Kingdom of Canada has become the top destination for these fleeing the violence. Many of the immigrants are legal, but an increasingly large number are not. Already there are refugee camps in upstate New York, many of them coming over from Pennsylvania, and their numbers are putting a strain on our supplies. Observers comment that the situation is likely to get worse before it gets better. American refugees, the irony. A proxy government in Alaska, the territory of Alaska is now under Canadian control, however. Our command over the region is loosening and local resistance is high. Driven to this, many are suggesting putting a proxy government in 
in control of Alaska to help better administer the region. A common suggestion man to have this administration would be George Perkis, but certainly Alaska a region for him. Keep Alaska, send Perkis. Whoops. Yeah. The Yankee Rebellion, while their intention upon occupying New England was to safeguard the locals from the ravages of the American Civil War, it seems that many of them have taken exception. Several leaders in Boston have publicly accused Canada of desiring solely uh, to return the area to British rule, to squeeze whatever we can out of the region so that we can return to the home isles, and that they would have been better off throwing up their lot with the American brothers and sisters. The fever of pitching the areas reached a point where they may reconsider a plan for New England and self government, or face a long period of uprisings. This will amount to nothing. This will amount to nothing, you know. King Albert and Royal Scandal. A member of the British royal family has been caught up in the royal scandal with the headlines in Canadian newspapers dominated by accusations of infidelity and deceit. Well, King Albert himself is not part of the scandal, it has not reflected well on the monarchy as a whole. Well, god dang it. Actions of the Yankee resistance, the resistance of the New England population against their occupation forces continues. Once again, terrorist groups operating within New England have a staging number of attacks aimed at crippling our infrastructure, our industrial output, and the morale of our forces. Freaking Yanks. We got a lot of events to read. Spanish Civil War's over. Oh, oops, forgot about that. We've been busy with other stuff. Puerto Rican militants attack patrols. With the siege of arms in recent months, it was clear that the nationalists were aiming to mount an insurgency today. We have received our first reports of skirmishes occurring in different parts of the island. While San Juan is safe for the time being, it's not uncommon to see armed mil militias roaming the surrounding areas to El, El Yunque, Carit, Susa, Susa, and the Marcaro, Macao Forest. While these insurgents have yet to take any direct action towards those main cities, it's clear that they're planning to eventually begin attacking them. Should we send reinforcements to the island? Send reinforcements. Yeah, why not? This burst is good. Happy 1937. I don't know if we're doing this right, but we'll see. Logistics, signals, maintenance. We do have tanks. Support equipment. Action of the Yankee Resistance. Yeah, there you go. Bro, can you, like, stop attacking? Synthetic oil experiments. You need more oil. Because we gotta start working on getting more political power, man. Dominion Day. Well, if you're gonna do that again, please go ahead. At least that's good for us. Nice. Alright, so there's nothing else we need to really do here, I guess. Uh, except for a refugee crisis. Defense back scheme one. Some years ago, military planners drew up several defense schemes to deal with the potential threats from America. This one details plans to fortify the border against incursion to occupy New England and Alaska to protect our flanks. Updating it for the current situation could prove useful, especially as tensions rise in the U.S. Research speed. Purge is disloyal opposition, which would be great, removing a breaking center and remove a divided nation. Now the Parliament has returned to the hands of the Royalists. The time is going to purge the ranks of the ministries and civil service and to stifle further opposition. If the nation is to survive and prop in this dangerous world, it must be united under its king. Yeah, absolutely. In prison, the nationalist leader, as the nationalist guerrillas continue fighting on the countryside, the leader, Pedro Alb Albizu Campos, continue living comfortably at the corner of the Sol and Cruz streets in the old section of San Juan. With the situation escalating, a permanent guard was set up around this home and personal life. A police car is stationed at the front at all times. Photographs of any person entering or exiting the complex are taken. Whenever Albizu exits his home, the central radio of the police force is informed and relays information to all the police forces around the island. Whenever he or his family goes out for a walk, they're followed by a police officer and all correspondence to the house have been intercepted. Despite all this, little evidence has been found to link him to the insurgents. Although he has been seen providing stirring speeches to crowds in different parts of the nation, asking people merely to fight for independence, which later, later inspires people to join the militias. While his evidence is rather shaky, it can be enough to put El Bizu behind the bars temporarily. The problem is that the nationalists are not bound to let that happen without a fight, as El Bizu is seen widely as a national hero, but letting him free is clearly the only escalating the situation further. Um, imprison him? That's going to rile people up, though, isn't it? He's innocent until proven guilty. Well, would you look at that. The Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican nationals surrender. After months of seemingly unsuccessful guerrilla warfare, short in supplies and just as popular sentiment towards independence is dying down. Nationals and insurgents have begun coming out of the forest and surrounding toward garrison. It seems that finally their grip on the island is starting to be secure. 
But that's some good news. Upstate New York refugee situation worsens. While officials in upstate New York have already been struggling to contain the numbers of American refugees crossing the border, recently the situation has grown even worse. Even more refugees, mostly coming from Pennsylvania, have already arrived and put an increasing strain on the province's infrastructure. So it ends soon. And the British exile arrested. Oh no. A wealthy British exile, who was also a highly placed member of King Albert's inner circle, was recently arrested for the murder of his wife, also an exile living in the Kingdom of Canada. Why'd you get caught? Come on. The charge brings up several sticky points, not least of which is whether Canadian courts have jurisdiction over a British national. Other expatriates have been arrested in the past, but never someone of such high profile in the press has poured on the pounce on the scandal to the point where the public lingers over each day's lurid headlines. King Albert said that he would be willing to personally intervene on the man's behalf, but the king's reputation is poor enough as it is. If he did so, there would be riots, thus, m many times, it's safe for the government to step in. Now, he has very low influence, which is not good. Although the trial would play out, Canadian government must intervene. No, we're good. Influence is moderate, which is not good. But we're seeking, we'd still direct the British exiles. However, we increase their influence, which is not bad. We could get assist the Canadian government, ooh, which is 15%. Um, or we could help the king's popularity. 50% would be really nice and would give us more stability immediately and a little bit more political power. Uh, God. Mm. Can we do anything else here yet? No. We have exile power. Um, I'll point Canadians. Yeah, I want to showcase British culture and achievements. Uh, we need that political power. We are, like, poor. And even though I want Prince Albert to be, King Albert to be, you know, like, good and all, but, like, we at least need to be balanced here for political power. Royal address. Uh, also, I did go get grab some tea as well. Expand labor camps. Huh. Weekly stability goes way down. That's not good. Uh-uh. Consolidate power like that, but we need, we need more political power. Do we need land forts here? Oh, look at this. Deal with the Yankee rebels in New York. So called Yankee rebellion is costing us dearly. We have little choice but to send in forces and deal with the situation before it gets out of hand. We lose a lot of political power and recovery rate and get more compliance. Oh, God. Oh, there we go. Our intervention in the American Civil Wars resulted in our occupation in New England, which is currently providing, proving to be quite the pain. So called Yankee rebellion openly calling for unwanted presence. Our unwanted presence, an aggressive act of war against all Americans. Well, you have a bunch of treaties in us Americans. What did you expect was going to happen? So we got six million people there. A lot of resistance. Six million, four and a half. Not not even a million. Connecticut has quite a few. Rhode Island is represented too. We'll do upstate New York first. Kinda of have to. When we remove get some political power back. And start with compliance to twenty five percent, which is pretty decent overall. Okay, I just want to kill the syndicalists. That's really what I want to do. Attacked by Yankee guerrillas, the Yankee insurrectionists in England have launched full-scale full assault against our occupation forces. Well, there goes those people. Goodbye. I'm still purging these people. Purges are fun. What is it? Award noble titles. Getting ability to get more political power, stability, construction speed, and more base stability. Empire of the RCMP. Get the Mounties. Interesting. Five. Popularity of Pernod Autocrats goes up. Collaborate with the social credits, peoples, or we get this. This isn't fun at all, but like we need more benefits here. Anti Syndicalist Decree. Would be nice. Anti Syndicalist Decree, which is decent, less damage to garrisons. Uh, English primary language primacy. And intermittent tensions with the Quebec will be resolved, which would be nice actually. Get more recovery rate, less low recruitable population factor, less stability, but defensive core territory. Um, award noble titles, unlike Britain, Canada did not seek to build its own nobility. The nobility that fled maintained their titles to lands they did not hold. However, with the role of the monarchy secure, the king has sought to create a truly Canadian noble class, with unique Canadian peerage titles being created. Soon, politicians and officers of a gentry who do not yet have a title can be granted one, so soon high society will overflow with new dukes, viscounts, earls, and marquises. Uh, she'll be inducted into the high society. While to some, having the title of Earl of Alberta, Viscount of Calgary, or a baron of New Brunswick may seem strange, or will assume that this frigid land is no different to the home they left behind. An English primary language. Primacy. While we hold no disdain for the French, we cannot deny that the English are the true rulers of this nation. English should be held as the sole language of the governance within Canada, while programs uh, supporting the English uh, language will be set up in French-Canadian majority territories. Also, I might have had a reload the game, too, maybe. Oh, look at this! They actually pushed in. Well... They're still doing the same old crap that they did before. Not smart. We're down there.
and we're actually getting half a political power today, a new British Prime Minister. The day of the long expected since his majesty is making direct use of his vast royal prerogative, Stanley Baldwin has been dismissed as the Prime Minister of the UK's government in exile. No! My stability! While the days of the post is only symbolic office to offer the public face for the exiles, the position of Prime Minister is one that will still carry the great weight. Indeed, while political they may have no little to no power, as public face of the exiles, their words and deeds are greatly followed by the media, and thus reflected on the Canadian public, they be them exiled or not. And Stanley Baldwin being no fan of his most gracious majesty, and his flexing of his prerogatives, is a reasonable move that such a man be removed from such an influential position. As for his replacement, his majesty had picked two possible replacements, namely William Aitken, 1st Baron Beaverbrook, and Harold Harmsworth, 1st Viscount Rothenmeyer. Both men are well known to the king as both leaders of respectable media empires. Indeed, they are nearly a third of the news that is published in Canada, and the wider empire go through one of the two of the men's companies. Both men are also fairly friendly with the government of the king, although it would not be an exaggeration to call the Viscount Rothmere a dire loyalist with deep ties to the uh, United Empire League. The Baron Beaverbrook, or Beaverbrook, for his part, has an incredible mind for logistics, being known for bringing a vital and vibrant energy to any logistical problem he touches along with this. The Baron Beaverbrook, as a native Canadian being born in Ontario in 1879, due to this, Aitken was seen by those close to the king as a way to play the Canadians that were all in this together. Either way, by appointing one of the two, these two men, the king ensures that not only, not only with a man who knows how to play the media, but practically ensures the support of a media empire. With his choices being limited to two, his majesty elects to appoint the Count Viscount Rothamir, paternal autocracy. No. Uh, weekly war sport goes up by point three, and he gets political power, or Baron Beaverbrook. Political power gain and po already popularity stability modifier. I cannot get. I have to go with Rothmere. Well, that weekly war spot sounds really nice. Now we no longer get weekly stability change, really, but we get more weekly war sport, which is, you know, something else. Not bad. Western Command and Center requires aid in the U.S. An outpost made up of the Federalist forces trapped in the West under General Omar Bradley is fighting a desperate fight for survival. They're now requesting aid from the Entente in the fight against populism, socialism, and the Pacific. Unlike the more ambiguously friendly MacArthur in the Pacific States, the WCC leadership seems far more respectable to the Entente, particularly Canada. Uh, many of our advisors believe their survival would be in our best interest. Of course, as others believe them to be a lost cause, we, they recommend we do not loan them firearms, funds, and small grouping of independent volunteers, as it would only antagonize a victorious faction. You know what? You can have aid. We'll try it. Need more guns, so we'll buy some more if we can. What do you have here? Charismatic, offensive, next planner. That's fine. Become a thorough planner. Actually, you know, since we're here, can we even invade some people here? What in the line is nice, but can we go to like Bombay or something? I did send the Navy over here, so. For naval exercises. Major Yankee Offensive. We're under attack throughout New England. A major coordinated uprising has occurred in every city from Boston, Bangor, to Buffalo. Our soldiers and leaders are a constant attack uh, throughout New England. A number of leaders in Canada requesting we begin to examine how we are ruling the New Englanders. Bloody Yanks. All them bloody Yanks. Good. Mass holes. Yeah, we don't have any problems with New uh, Quebec either. What is this? Crusader King. Yeah, I can't do that one yet. Uh, limited conscription cannot be enacted in peacetime with minimal resistance. Well, empower the RCMP. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police are Canada's first line of defense against radicals and criminals, preventing our nation from plunging into the woes of civil uh, unrest on several occasions. With well, the Canadian populace rests us out of the King's assumption of power. Uh, the R and RCMP will be given all the power. They need to ensure that our nation is not plunged into the chaos of violence and revolution, sparing the Great White North from the fate from which befell Britain. Ooh. Oh, we can do this one crossing the border. The time has come. We must prepare to cross the southern border and wage into the mess that the American has become. We cannot stand idly by, though we must remember that the times have changed since the War of 1812. This time we're facing a foe that outnumbers and outguns us by several measures. The Hobbit or there and back again. The George Alwyn Unwin Publishing House put out a new book by George, a British emigre, J.R.R. Tolkien, who returned to South Africa following the revolution. 
tells the story of Bilbo Baggins, a strange small creature called a hobbit who goes on an adventure featuring wizards, dwarves, giants, goblins, and a fire-breathing dragon before returning home a wealthy man. The tale has already received widespread critical acclaim, and Tolkien has been nominated for literary praise prizes. There have been hints that he's working on something longer and larger, but the author's notorious perfectionism might well delay his publishing. A delightful little story. Trade agreement with Norway. Norway has recent approaches regarding a trade agreement. They're one of the countries in Europe, not uh, geographically, most geographically close to us, and closing down trade barriers with them would mean better relations and economic growth for both of us and the Norwegians. It could also be beneficial that we would gain an economic foothold in Northern Europe, which we could use as a stepping stone for greater ambitions. Nah, we're good. And within the last three years, oh. Well, let's start building up our political power, shall we? British exiles, I love them. We want to cross the border, though. Or a bunch of border crossers here. Hello? Thanks. Action of the Yankee Resistance, of course. Freaking Yanks. Hey, man, it's company. Look at that. We will probably honestly need these a lot. Research speed, huh? Piercing for infantry equipment. Funds. Well, let's go this one, I guess. Oh. Can we enable invade Bombay? What do they even have here? A single division? If they throw even one more division, we definitely can't take it. And there's your just gone. And we also have a keep, cup, keep, a cup of white tea here to keep us nice and uh, satisfied. Oh god. Oh god, that's not good. That's really bad, actually. God dang it, I want to go to war with the Americans because they're killing themselves too. Why? Um, with this. Fear of the Royal Prerogatives. With His Majesty's flexing those royal prerogatives during a time of great crisis, it was able to secure order even as the nation was falling apart. Much time has passed since from then, and all know that the prerogatives are here to stay, mainly wondering exactly how long it is. When he first made use of them, His Majesty made no declar declaration that such an act was only temporary. Yet many Canadians are beginning to think that when Britain has been reclaimed, the prerogatives shall be laid down, and Canada's democratic traditions may once again flourish. Due to this belief, many Canadians have accepted the status quo, however, not all have. Many Canadians, mostly former members of the Parliament, approached King and asked him to formally declare that, once Britain has been liberated, Canada shall return to normalcy. Interesting enough, some members of the exiles, among them many within the so-called English mystery, have called for the King to increase his use of the prerogatives, in fact. This group has pressed the King to formalize, formalize dissolve uh, Canada's government, reinstating direct British rule, which as King of the United Kingdom, an entity that nominally has authority over Canada, meaning the King could dissolve Canada without issue. By doing this, His Highness could also be seen as implementing the first step of an Imperial Federation, a goal that is considered to be the logical endpoint for the entire colonial project. With two radically different proposals, with heavy backing towards both, His Majesty has been put into a corner, a corner that shall see uh, either see an eventual return to normalcy or an end of Canada itself. Pick the Canadians, once Britain is free, so Canada shall be freed. Canada, of course, is a failed project, along with the Empire. Oh god. Oh, United Kingdom in Canada. Hey, Hawaii wants to join the Entente. Uh, they've sent an ambassador to us to meet with the king and prime minister in order to bring Hawaii to the Entente. Should we accept the Canadian's offers? Of course they can. Connecticut has more people there. Send in the army. That wouldn't be bad. Well, welcome to the United Kingdom, everybody. Um, IEDC. Invite Hawaii in. Actions, freaking yanks. Do they do anything for us? Um, God dang it, they, they threw in more divisions. Three divisions, actually. God. We were doing so well for a second there. And of course, Hawaii agrees. So, as much as I want to invest in Canada again, we're going to invest in. Delhi? Good God. Let's go with the. Australasians? I think I did them already, though. You know, we'll invest in the West Indies. Just because we said we would, 
So we will. Oh, Miles. Canadian decisions. So with you guys... Or you're returning home. I apologize for killing a few of you off. Well, I might send you to uh, Nepal. Um, hope you got your jackets. You're going to definitely need them. Going across the border. Quid pro quo. They need our help to take out the syndicalists. We cannot afford to have syndicalists here. Just can't. Canadian manners. The culture intermingling between British and Canada, while the subject of a natural fusion, has been deliberately uh, encouraged uh, set up by the exiled uh, government to help assimilate Canadians into the new empire. One such mark of those grand mansions is grand mansions. Truly breathtaking manners have begun to define the Canadian countryside. These new residences have been modeled off the stately homes of the old country, which have been sadly lost to the syndicalists, while it's hoped that these resi residences can one day be reclaimed and inhabited by the rightful owners once more, like these Canadian mansions will make do until the day of reclamation can come. The abbeys of, of Oberon, instead of being home to barons and earls, are home to the new aristocracy of the Union of Britain. Union chiefs and representatives who have continued running these mansions in much the same way as their old royalist inhabitants. While a few manors have been reclaimed by the servants, it seems that the Union of Britain continues to appear in much the same way as the United Kingdom. The only difference is that we're honest about our intentions. Riots throughout New England. Th throughout the cities of New England, uh, there are major protests and riots uh, protesting the occupation of the Canadian forces in the region. In a number of cities, these protests have turned violent and it looks like things are getting worse. It does not look like these protests are going to end anytime soon. Blasted Yanks. We're going to cross the border. Defense scheme number one. Reach across the Atlantic. Doctor, to be nice. Uh, but we have to do address the army. We have to address the army as we're going to go to war, right? It's less than 20% surrender to Congress and controls at least 25 states. No. Well, we got quite a bit of political power right now. Ruling party support goes up, which would be nice because it gives us more daily political power, but I want more stability as well. More support, British government and exiles. Or we could go to partial mobilization. We do lose more political power that way too. Hmm. Finish Sir Abercrombie's work. The Honorable Lieutenant uh, General Sir Alf Abercrombie was a true English hero, always ready to fight against a meddling Frenchman, be he a royalist or a revolutionary upstart. Unfortunately, he wasn't as lucky when fighting the Spaniards in 1797. The expedition went to Puerto Rico, inflicting massive losses on the Spanish side, as cost him too, and forced to withdraw from San Juan. Over a hundred years later, we are in a position to finish Sir Abercrombie's venture by putting the former American territory under our full control once and for all, oh, of course. That, but I also want more stability too. You know what? Get the stability. Stability is too good to pass up. And can we do anything else here as well? Yes. We can direct the exiles. We need more popular. Uh, oh, we can do that one. Is this is the first government. That'd be really nice. Increase their own influence though first. That'd be good. And then, crush Canadian nationalism. Showcase British culture and achievements. 5%, 5%. Point Canadians? No. Upon excess to high ranking positions. Influence will increase. Influence increase. Well, how about this one? Our British cultural ties have aided greatly in helping the Canadians grow accustomed to the exiles and the exile government. To further strengthen the power of the exiles, will promote British culture and achievements and make all Canadians truly grateful to live in a society shaped by the British. Oh, we won! Good job. You made it. You didn't even make it all the way over there. Congrats. You might be able to go to Surat though. I got some oil processing is done, which is very good. Uh, we can get some anti-tank, I guess. I might be playing this completely wrong. I don't know. We'll see. There's so much we we want to do, but we can't. Address the army. We just have to address the army. The Vanier plan. Spirit power, power, mobile warfare. No, we're gonna go with manpower probably. Um, yeah, focus on the army. New warfare. Ooh, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. That's really good though. That's very good war propaganda. I think I'll go with the veneer plan. George Venier, a respected commander by the Canadian Corps during the Great War, proposes a theory of warfare developed from his experiences on the Western Front. His approach emphasizes training and equipment quality so that every man of ours is worth three of theirs. We need more guns. Good. 
Let them attack and get even weaker, maybe. Alright, what do we got here, too, now? Good. Yeah, no. 15 is not bad. I like 18 there. Going that. Combat support. God, it's 25. That's so much. Make them thicker. Screw it. And make you guys... I mean, you're going to get all the stuff as fast as you possibly can, too. So that's good. Get more guns now, too. Dang it. Thicker, better, stronger. Overall, just better. Let's talk about the army. With uh, Sir Arthur Curie home, the time has come to select a new man to lead both the British and Canadian forces to victory on the ground. Arthur Curie was the highest ranking officer within the Canadian and British armed forces, with the army being mostly under Canadian command, and many sought a Canadian for the post. Despite this, King Albert and Prime Minister all having but, a, but anointed JFC Boney Fuhrer. Fuller, with the title, convinced his ideas of mechanizing the military are exactly the kind of ideas we need. They both seem to have forgotten, however, the majority of the lives on the line will be the Canadian. Several ministers have pointed out that George's veneer is more than qualified, more than qualified, and keep the British from flooring away Canadian lives in another Gallipoli. Oh, man. But Fuller is meant for the job. Ugh, the Fuller plan? Have you gone down a line doctrine yet? It's only one. It's fine. Hmm. I get rid of the political. I get so much political power from that. Quebec and flames. Huh. Best anti syndicalist decree of the National Security Act. King Albert's popularity will increase. Ability to reinforce it. It's not bad. We can wait for that stuff, though. It, seem, it seems like we can. Um, preparations for war. Rally the exiles. It's not bad. Project Plow. Take them to islands. Interesting. Reach across the Atlantic. Infantry equipment. Everything gets cheaper to produce. Overhaul the Navy. Now we're gonna do this one next. Screw it. Mountaineers. Oh, well, we're not really using Mountaineers right now, though. So, yeah. Oh, Royal Visit to Nepal, huh? Forty three percent roll tension, that's not enough. IEDC. Uh huh. It's almost ninety three eight, so we're gonna go that one next. It's fine if they hate us, whatever. We don't care. Oh, British Axel is very low. That's not good. Portugal asks us to rejoin the Entente formally. After the end of Valkyrie, with the signing of the peace with honor, and even more so after the Revolution of 25, Britain and Portugal have drifted further and further apart despite remaining in a formal alliance. But now, as dangerous times begin to threaten Europe, the town reclaim the birthright is fast approaching. Portugal asks us for support and will, in turn, provide support during the fast approaching Second Valkyrie. But the renewal of the treaty we will stop cynicalism. You betcha. Join us, Portugal. I'm sure you'd love to do it. Yes, I would. Look at that. Best game number one. Seven years ago, uh, this is good. The Rich of St. John upon Pedras. There's a reason why the Spanish conquistadors called the island a rich port. Puerto Rico is home to much treasure which would never serve our nation well. Sent out for new expeditions in the search to set out from the administrative cap capital of the island. 
or the Isle, a city which many of our soldiers began to jokingly call St. John upon Pedras as a reminder of naming conventions of our true home. 38. These would be pretty good overall. Alright, he's good. We need more cast though. Do we have any range here at all? I guess not. Well, let's do this build one of these things. All right, so these guys doing that, we're gonna push in. We should be able to now that these guys are actually like decent. Twenty combat with divisions, artillery and support artillery. And I hope we can start grinding this out and make India like finally okay. Oh no, they're attacking us, especially over the river. Bad idea when they're attacking the Marines like that. Can you actually attack this way too? You might be able to. There you go. Do that too. Marines should be able to beat him up. Happy 1938 though, everybody. Alright, we're going to come back over here. And, oh, actually, we do this first. Deal with them bloody Yanks. Savage promise Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico's state has been caught in quite the kerfuffle since it was seized by the Royal Navy. Similarly to when they were under the United States, Puerto Rico has no formal representation within Parliament, leaving their citizens unrepresented. To fix this, Puerto Rico has been admitted as Canada's 11th province, providing their representation and legitimizing our government in the eyes of the Puerto Ricans. Additionally, Spanish language programs will be started to first several servants to make Puerto Ricans feel more at home in Canada. Already, Puerto Rico is becoming a hub of Canadian business and tourism, with many facets of Puerto Rican culture becoming common in the mainland Canada. Heck yeah. U.S. Virgin Islands? Well, we'll call them the Canadian Virgin Islands next. I'm sorry that we've not done very much here, but it is what it is, you know, with what we got. I never play, I usually don't play Canada because it's just not as much fun usually, but still. As long as you hold, we should be okay. I'll support the attack. You're over a river, but you're Marine, so you should be okay at that. Diplomatic move in Ireland? Ireland. Nice. Now we're doing better overall. Look at that. Hey, we actually encircled some divisions and killed them off. We're actually doing stuff here finally. And we actually have an air base here too. So now maybe we can use air stuff too. Well, not much since we have no fuel, but whatever. I don't think they have an air force. I could be very wrong. But. We're going to do the bomb the crap out of them if we can. Because I like bombing people. You know, we're American. Or Canadian here. Come on. So that's all done. I want to get that done just because we could. Um, economic recovery. Finally, initiatives have borne fruit. The era of the Great Depression is over, and we can move forward into prosperity once more. We're still putting up more civvies. Let's start building some millies up, too. And what, you go top, you go there. That's an air base right there, too. Beautiful. Um, could you actually do an encirclement here? Go there to there. Let's save. There you go. And there you go. Should be able to do this, right? And best fifty put the power, that'd be good. Deal with the Yanks in Rhode Island. The IEDC. Um we could invest in ourselves. We'll do India. Uh, what do we want here? Resource efficiency game, better consumer goods factors, factory output. Or more construction speed. Twenty percent is not bad. Twenty percent is actually pretty darn good. But we get more. So this will boost us up to what? Two more? Three more, really, actually. 
So, a better resource efficiency gain too. That would help with our steel, chromium, aluminum, fuel output. Rev flood. If you don't know about that, please go ahead. Oh god, that's not good. I guess hit that thing out there. Okay. Good door. Pounders. Nice. Yep. There you go. Let these guys leave first. A Canadian, Canadian literary uh, landmark. Since Canada's birth, it had famously famous novels and possesses rich as multicultural literature written by French, English, indigenous, and even Gaelic languages. Oh god, hold on. We're about to die here. God dang it. Urgh. God, I hate the AI. A country ever lacks children's literature, and children need stories that they can relate to, and that'll help them understand the world around them. That is exactly what Lucy Maud Montgomery is doing. Born in November of 1874, Montgomery is a prolific writer, publishing over 100 stories between 1897 and 1907. However, one of her most notable works was released in 1908, Anne of Green Gables. It describes the adventures of Anne Shirley, an 11-year-old orphan girl in the pastoral town community of fictional Avalon, Avonlea, located in Prince Edward Island. The novel follows Anne's adventure and growth as she finds a home and family on the island. Although she encounters both struggles and triumphs, her own personal growth inspires readers of all ages. It's also imperative to mention that with her optimism, enthusiasm, and imagination, she quickly won the hearts of the townspeople. Despite the troubled times we are experiencing, the book offers something more for us to learn from. Received with overwhelming critical success from around the globe, Montgomery's book has been deemed a classic and has paved the way for Canada's children's literature scene. Montgomery. As a staunch supporter of the Entente, horrified by German atrocities in Belgium, she urged several young Canadian men to enlist in the Canadian Expeditionary Force and celebrated every victory achieved during the first Valkyrie, a true example of what a Canadian should strive to be. But we're probably going to end it there after we read at least one more. Uh, mandatory enrollment. Eh, that wouldn't be bad. But I like the Mounties. I think we'll actually do this one as well if we possibly can. And uh, we'll overhaul the Navy. The largest remnant of the Royal Navy still sits in Halifax Harbor now. Slowly aging and still under the command of the British Admiralty and XL. It remains separated. Or separate from the Canadian chain of command, but this cannot continue. The Canadian and British navies need to act as one. But if you enjoyed the video, though, please consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow when the Valkyrie might just kick off and we'll try to save India. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.